On this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we visit with Tom Lippman from Ohio. Tom shares some of the stories and hunts from his last 30 years of hunting, including an insane Idaho mountain lion story and a ton of Ohio whitetail bucks that he's tagged over the years. If you enjoy the episode and want to help us out, hit the thumbs up and tell us who you'd like to see on the show next in the comments. Now let's get into the episode. The Exodus team is traveling around the United States to take a look inside the trophy rooms of some of the most interesting whitetail hunters in the country. From giant bucks, unique racks, and riveting stories, welcome to Whitetail Cribs. Hey, come on in. I'm Tom Lippman. Welcome to my house. This is my kitchen, my fireplace. You know, it's kind of like an outdoor setup. And we'll go in the basement where I guess my trophy room is. My, my, my wife makes me, you know, keep all my animals down here. So come on down. I have two boys that are 16 and 13. And this is where we work out, you know, they're athletes and, uh, you know, we try to stay somewhat fit and this is where it all happens. And then right off that is my trophy room. Come on in. So this is my trophy room. I moved here. We, I built this house in 2005. Um, I'm currently an insurance agent. I went to college at Mount Union College where um, I studied to be an elementary education teacher. And so the first couple of years I was a teacher, which gave me summers off. I've always been into hunting and fishing. Um, and that's about when it started, I guess in about 1989, 1990, you know, I really started hunting quite a bit and it all begins down here. If you want to come down, I'll start down here. So these are some of my, my earliest box. One of my first ones is hidden back here. You know, it's not very big, but it's one of my first box. And then, you know, gradually, you know, progressing. You can see how they're, you know, maybe kind of dated, but like this here is probably, you know, one of my first, and it was a local deer in the area. I hunted him for, I think two years. Um, I had to take a, a year off because I fell out of a tree stand. It was the winter time and the cables got old and it released like a trap door and I fell like 22 feet and I thought I was okay. And I went to stand up and I looked and a bone was coming through my boot. So the very next year I got him, I ended up getting him, same exact place. Whenever I see him, that's what I, I think about is that stand breaking and falling and laying there in the middle of the woods with the bone coming through my foot. My 16 year old, this is probably the second or third deer that he shot down in Southern Ohio. And I really wanted him dead because he was such a cool deer if you look at him. How he has these curls that match on both sides. I've never ever seen a deer like this. They curl in here evenly, they have this ice cream kind of curl on both sides. There was something a matter with the deer. Um, when we got him, we went to, you know, got him within the first hour or two. And when we cut the deer open, he hit it behind the shoulders, didn't hit it in the guts. Uh, it, it, it was the most rotten smell, you know, I've ever smelled. We at least tried to take the back straps out of it and they, you know, they tasted foul. You know, it's just, there was something a matter with that deer. You know, I don't, I don't know what it was, whether he was hit by a car, or he had some kind of disease, but you know, just kind of a neat deer. I've been out west one time in my life hunting. Um, I went on a on elk hunting trip and I bought a predator tag and uh, we were in Idaho, in Upper Peninsula, Idaho, which is really rough. And we slept in tents, we'd hear wolves all night and they warned us about, you know, the mountain lion population and be careful. I saw a mule deer coming down a mountain and it was all bloody and it was de delirious. And I didn't know whether it had a disease and it fell down the rocks or what was wrong, you know, with the mule deer, you know, it was, a, it was a doe. And all of a sudden I looked up on his rock and he was just perched there just like a cat. And he jumped about 12 feet off this rock and he went down and he swiped the legs out from under the doe and he wouldn't kill it. He was just toying with it like a mouse. And the deer you know, went down, it would try to get back up, it'd fall down, and it, it was like playing with it. It was eventually gonna kill it. The guide said that they shoot, uh, they, 
they, sh they, they eat a deer a week or an elk every two weeks is what they kill. All our guides quit but one, so I was kind of like by myself. And I shot him, and he jumped about 10 feet in the air, came down, and he went in this real thick pine thicket. I called the guide, and the guy goes, well, listen, I can't get down here. you got to go get him by yourself. So, you know, I was younger, and I got my 7mm in one hand and a knife in another hand. I'm going through these pines. My heart's beating out of my chest, and there's this little specks of blood. I thought I wounded him. I said, this thing's going to kill me, you know. I'm, I'm, you know, I couldn't see eight feet in front of me. And uh, I actually went in there and I hit him right, right, right behind the shoulder and it was, it was laying there dead. You know, at the end of it, I called him back. I said, I did get him. He goes, well, listen, you're gonna have to skin it out yourself and uh, get it out of there. And I've never done that. So he kind of told me on the, the walkie talkie how to do it. I did it, you know, got it back out halfway up the hill. You know, my, uh, you know, I'm exhausted. I got this cat hanging over my shoulders and I lay it on the ground. I take a break and I look up and there's a six by six looking at me about 400 yards away. Biggest elk, only big elk I saw the whole week. And, you know, my gun's laying there, but I didn't have shooting sticks. You know, I, I didn't get a shot. He smelled the blood or he smelled me and he, he took off. But uh, it, was, it was neat still getting him and seeing an elk like that, you know, shortly thereafter. Getting him through the airport, they told me to freeze him in my backpack and um, just, you know, check him. So I froze him, I'm, he's in my backpack and I go through the airport and this, this, this lady looks at me and she goes, honey, what's in the bag? You know, it went through the x-ray machine. And I said, a mountain lion. So a friend of hers was working as one of the check ladies and she goes, x-ray check. And this lady comes out with like, you know, really nice nails and she comes up to me and she goes, well, what do we have here? And I said, she goes, and the, her friend was behind her going like this, and I, I just handed her the bag. And she unzipped it, and the face was looking up. She goes, oh, you'll be good. <laughs> and she let me go through. There could have been anything in that bag. So kind of a funny story with the cat. When I first moved to this house in 2005, this was actually a couple hundred yards from where the house was. And, you know, I recall, you know, getting him on film and thinking it was one of the biggest deer, you know, I'd, I'd ever seen. I would keep crops up. I'd, I'd started messing around with food plots. And, uh, you know, I, that was actually a late season buck. This one here was also local from my house. It was probably two years later and I thought he was one of the biggest bucks I've ever seen. You know, same type of story. It was kind of later in the season. I kept an acre of corn up. I'd brush hog a couple rows at a time so there was always food around. And he ended up stepping out. One of my favorite days regarding the rut is November 9th. And, and really, I really don't care what happens with the moon or anything with the moon phase. November 9th around here has always been one of my favorite days. I was just talking to somebody, was talk, we were talking about the, the largest deer this year and, and when it was on camera, and I think he told me it was November 10th. November 9th has always been, and a number of these deer locally were killed on November 9th. Um, this was one of them. This is actually a really old deer. If anything, he was declining in size. You see the gray on his face and his tine length is shrinking. Um, November 9th. This was a big six point that I shot. It was just unique and I liked him and I, I really wanted to get him because I just didn't want these genes around. And that was probably, I probably shot him in 2007, 2008. And to this day, there's still genes like that in the area. About that time, I was introduced to, to Southern Ohio. And I currently own some property down there. And I coyote hunt quite a bit. And I coyote hunt for a, a, a dairy farmer, a cattle beef farmer that has 3,000 head of cattle and about 30,000 acres. And I'm kind of his coyote control guy. And as a benefit, he lets me deer hunt. So we'll start getting into some Southern Ohio deer now um, and mixed in with some, some deer locally as well. This one here and these two here are some of my first Southern Ohio deer. So it was before my, you know, my kids were active in sports and I could spend a couple weekends down there and, and I, I, I love, I still love going down there. This one here, it was actually a local, local deer at my house and it, it was right around that November 9th time and uh, it was raining and I love hunting in the drizzly rain when it's not windy. I think deer like to get on their feet then. It's one of my, 
you know, I'll go out and sit in the rain. And I asked my son to go and he goes, I'm not going out to sit in the rain. So I went by myself and I came back with him. He showed up chasing does. I've never seen him, never, not one picture of him. And that's how I got him. That was in November 9th year as well. This one here, I was getting a ton of pictures around November 9th. I've never seen this deer before until the beginning of November. And he was coming from um, across the road and he disappeared. And I'll tell you a funny story about him is probably at least two miles up the road, maybe three miles up the road, a buddy of mine was getting him on film chasing does and said, look at this deer that I've been getting on film. So I, we compared pictures and I was getting pictures of him for a month in October up to about beginning of November. And then again, he disappeared and he showed back up December 6th. And uh, I think I got him December 12th and he was a rock star. He was hungry. Um, I, I had a acre of, of soybean that I left up and he, whether he was coming over for the does or mainly just to eat, he, he was pretty patternable, you know, with the, with the soybeans. These two Southern Ohio bucks, again, they, they kind of got bigger every year. Shot this one at two o'clock in the afternoon. Walking to my stand, I heard a grunt. I heard a doe come up over. I was walking in with my bow. I got to my knees and I never saw him before. I actually shot this one off the ground. This one here was, was shot um, out, of a, out of a tree stand, kind of early season. I did see him from a distance and, and kind of moved into that area. Down in Southern Ohio, it's kind of rolling hills with not a lot of timber. And he was slipping right behind this old lady's house. And, and he would bed right next to a guardrail on the highway. I set up on him after a couple days. And um, if you've ever been down there, it's kind of these little green bar briar bottom thickets and they travel the edges of them. And that's how I got him. I'll get into one of the biggest deer I've ever shot. And this one here, and it's, it's on the cover of a local newspaper, a place called Monty's weighed him. And they said it's one of the heaviest deer that ever hung there. He, he dressed out at 265 pounds. And when I saw him against does, he just looked like the hawk. You know, he was just a big, huge deer. I actually saw him at night uh, driving down the railroad tracks. He jumped in front of me and I almost hit him with my, my four-wheeler coming home one night. And I never knew he was there. And it looked, it just looked like a, a bull elk when he, when he jumped out in front of me. So I ended up getting permission uh, from a lady that, that has some property that was close by. And I went, I went to get into my stand, I think it was 3.30 in the evening. And I, thought, I don't think it was getting dark till like 6.30. And he was already out in the field chasing some does. And I kind of boogered them. They ran in the woods. And I said, oh, I, you know, I, was, I was bummed out. And uh, as I'm pulling my bow up the tree, some does ran by and I heard a large, uh, you know, a loud grunt and it was him. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I just got my bow up and he passed me. And my heart sunk again. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I can't believe this, this happened. And uh, sure enough, he got out to the field. The does came out in front of me and, and here he came, I, a 12 yard shot. When he laid there, I, 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 I just kind of stared at him, amazed at, how, at his body mainly. But you know, he, he's a good sized, nice framed deer, but he was just a battle warrior. He's so gray in the face. Um, you know, he's all beat up on the ears from fighting. Uh, just, just a big swamp buck. I'll get into probably the last one I shot locally. That was this one here. And this was in the winter time. It was muzzleloader season. I never knew this deer existed, and uh, I was hunting on a neighbor's property, probably has, you know, 70, 80 acres, and again, I just, I've never seen him. It was a really crunchy, crunchy morning, and I got into a really fresh, large track, and I just looked at the direction that the track was going, and there was a fallen log, and at the top of the fallen log, I saw these tines sticking up, and I go, what? and they moved just, just slightly. And I went, oh my God, you know, he's laying right there. And I couldn't believe he let me get this close. You know, it was probably 50 yards, how, how crunchy the ground was, you know? Um, it was like walking on cornflakes. He just wouldn't move. I whistled at him. I just wanted him to stand up. Well, here he was hurt. And you can see how skinny he was. Somebody had shot him, whether it was gun season or poaching him, he was shot in the face and he just 
probably hadn't eaten in a while or it's hard for him to eat. Um, when he finally stood up, um, I put one behind his shoulder, but it, it kind of traveled back and he probably ran 200 yards. And again, a very impressive, beautiful eight point. Um, he, he would have died shortly thereafter because again, he was, he was dwindling down to nothing because his jaw was broke and he was shot in the face. The rest of these, they're up on the wall and we'll kind of, you know, swing around to look at them are all Southern Ohio bucks. I just got to a point to where my wife makes me hide all these deer down here in this, in this room. And I lost my main taxidermist. So I started messing around with these European mounts and, you know, boiling them, or I bought beetles a couple of times and I tried dipping them, which I'm no good at. So, um, I'll start with this one here. This was a great big deer. Um, you know, they're down there, they're really nice mainframe tens, basically, you know, sometimes eights, but they, they generally have a very nice shape to them. I got on a high point coyote hunting in the morning. Um, you know, generally I probably shoot 20 to 30 coyotes a year. And he popped out of this greenbrier thicket in the morning and he went over and he bedded down again on this hillside. And uh, I knew he was in the area and within a week I shot him. Um, I knew where he bed. I, I knew where he went to bed the second time. I kind of had his area figured out just from that one morning coyote hunting. And a lot of these, I've kind of learned a lot from coyote hunting, whether it was late season or early season, like I'll go down in August when they throw the pups out and it's a good time for me to get on these high points coyote call and kind of like, you know, scout for deer as well. This one here, um, my buddy shot and wounded this a month before I killed him. And he had a softball size kind of pus sack where he hit him. And I spotted him actually dogging some does, and he, but he didn't look good. He couldn't jump a fence that the does jumped. So he went like kind of like the long way around and I knew he'd come out the same way. You know, he was just limited on where he could go, but we were still getting self or uh, uh, trail cam pictures of him, but I knew he was gonna die soon. So it was like the pressure was on to get him. He was just a beautiful 10 point. So he came down this fence row. There was no trees there. I made a little makeshift ground blind, easy 20 yard shot. Uh, this one here, um, I, I was set up archery hunting and he bedded down with some does. Um, I caught him bedding down with some does. I went again, kind of, kind of made a makeshift blind again, hunting off the ground. There's just not a lot of trees. There's no hardwoods down there. Um, it's the type of trees that have the big jaggers hanging out of them. It, impossible to get stands up in them most of the time. Shot him off the ground. This one here, I did shoot out of a tree stand kind of a pinch point where two fingers come together. A lot of strip mine area, it was the top of a strip mine. My son, this was his first deer. And I took him down Southern Ohio, and uh, kind of an interesting story with him. He originally had a drop tine earlier in the season, and he, he broke off his, his uh, drop tine. And my son, he was chasing some does, uh, it was the U season, and my son had a, it, he was about 170 yards out and um, my son hit him, but he hit him low and the deer ran out in this field and it laid down. I said, we'll just give him some time. And as we're giving him some time, again, the place was so coyote infested with the time, coyote smelled the blood and three of them got on him and, and started running them. They kind of actually ran him up towards, you know, my way. And uh, we, we ended up shooting one of the coyotes and they, it gave him a second shot that was closer at the deer, which he put it down one of the three shots, one of the ones he hit it in the hoof. And the Sabbath slug stuck right between the hoof. But that was his first deer, great deer for him. This deer was my youngest, who's 13. He shot that deer uh, actually this year. And I got a picture of him. That was his first decent buck and that was in Southern Ohio. You know, I'll never forget the, the gun barrel sticking out of the blind and it shaking like this, you know? That's pretty much it with, the, with, with my game room down here. Well, 
I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, taking a look at my game room and, you know, learning a little bit, maybe how I do things or what I think about when the best time of the rut is. Um, you know, I do scout a lot, whether it's long distance or late season. Seems to be some of my keys. Uh, I enjoy getting outside. But uh, I got things to do now, so it's time for you to get the hell out of my house, and uh, we'll go from there. Have a nice day. Thanks for watching this episode of Whitetail Cribs. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you're wondering who the heck we are and how the heck we travel across the country to record these episodes, we are Exodus Trail Cameras and simply believe quality trail cameras should not cost a fortune. That's why five years ago, we started a direct-to-consumer company to tackle some of the biggest frustrations we've seen as typical trail camera users, product longevity, product performance, and customer service. We simply build cameras that flat out work in the harshest conditions and back them up with best in class customer service. We're proud to say we have the industry's leading five year warranty that even includes theft and accidental damage coverage. If you'd like to learn more about Exodus and the products we have to offer, click the link in the description and head over to our website. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in a comment below or shoot us an email.